Hey folks, how are we doing? Um, I'm going to talk about a creature that you don't usually associate with the word uh, precious. There is 400 million of them in the world, um, and as the natural world is falling apart around us, these fellas are thriving, unfortunately, really. Um, generally in man-made urban environments, it's the humble pigeon. And <laughs> a special a special pigeon called JJ. So we, myself and my partner, uh, Mary, her cousin Jill kindly offered us her apartment in La Hinch in 2021 in June. Um, we were going to work from home from there for a few weeks just to get away from the kind of grim lockdowns in Dublin. So we went down and we got lucky with the weather. So we were just working away during the day and going like walking down the prom and in the beach in the evenings. Um, so because the weather was good, we had the door, the balcony open all day long just to let the fresh air in. And I heard a bit of a fluttering one day anyway, and I kind of went out to investigate, and there was a pigeon after landing on the balcony. Um, should point out at this stage that there's no pigeons in La Hinch. So <laughs> I, I think it's because it's coastal. That would be the obvious reason. But I have another theory that there are so many crusties and hippies in La Hinch that the pigeons don't like the smell of the place. <laughs> so you could tell straight away this wasn't your run of the mill pigeon. Like he had a bit of a swagger about him. Like he knew how to carry himself. He, um, he was in great condition. He had kind of unusual coloring. Um, he was ver very used to human contact, you could tell. And then he had a tag on his foot as well. So. I thought it was a bit weird, so I took a few photos, and we went off for dinner, and we met our mate, Jill, and she was saying, um, oh, that's a racing pigeon, and you can look up the details of the tag on the Pigeon Fancy or website or whatever it's called. <laughs> so, uh, so I was kind of intrigued in, so I was like, right, I'm going to go back and get stuck into this now, and got, uh, <laughs> got Got a good bit closer to JJ, and he was totally cool with it. And um, so I got the details. I put it up on the system. And the system is kind of like, let's say, if an adopted person was looking for their birth parents, you put the information out there, but they have to come to you, the pigeon fancy are like. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I put the details in. And it didn't take long. It was about a half an hour. And this fella, Tom from East Wall, rang me. And I could tell he was a die-hard dub, like a fucking Jackie, if you ever talked to him. <laughs> um, he, he was a gas. We were getting on grind anyway, and he was, uh, he was delighted that we had his pigeon, but he was kind of like, are you sure it's JJ? And I was like, well, <laughs> it's like, his fucking details and his tag match your fucking details. It'd be some coincidence if it wasn't. So he was telling me that the week before he had sent 12 pigeons to Penzance in Cornwall in the UK and only two of them had come home. So he said it was a big, there was a big incident like and after the call I looked it up and this was the biggest accident that's ever happened in the history of pigeon racing. <laughs> right? So. Like, it was doomsday for the pigeon folk. It was like, imagine the movie Armageddon, but without a meteor, it's just a shitload of pigeons. <laughs> so, um, so what, oh yeah, so they released, the weather was good the day they released the pigeons, and uh, everything was going tickety-boo until it wasn't. And they reckon between 10 and 15,000 prize pigeons were lost that day. Um, they were blown all over Europe. Um, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was lads landed in the Netherlands, in, 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 in Germany, and one, like, one real cute pigeon whore was after going to the Canary Islands. <laughs> so... So they're still not sure what happened, like, but they reckon it was a geological event, like a solar storm, right, which affected the Earth's magnetic field, which is what pigeons use, use to navigate. So you're getting two for one here, you're getting a story and a bit of education too. 
So of the 250,000 pigeons that was released in the UK that day across several locations, 15,000 of them got lost and one of those was blown 500 kilometres northwest to our balcony in Hinch. <laughs> so back to Tom anyway, and he was full of questions about his condition and how we were looking after him. And he was like, what are you feeding him? And uh, I was like, we're giving him a bit of, bit, giving him a bit of muesli, like. <laughs> uh, we, we were only giving him muesli because that was the thing that looked most like bird feed that we had, like. <laughs> He, se he seemed to be enjoying it, to be fair. I, he, 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 had a pro he had a problem with the raisins, all right? He went into the raisins. <laughs> but, um, so Tom was mad to get his pigeon back, obviously. No, he, but he didn't drive, which is another sign of a true dub, I think. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so he was like, can I get a train to La Hinch? And I was like, here, man, it's a train and about three buses. Like, you're gonna be, you're gonna be a week getting down here. So we ruled that one out. Um, the next option then was, oh yeah, he wanted me to throw him into the air to see if he'd, <laughs> he'd take, <laughs> see if he'd take back off back to Dublin. And I was like, John, he's 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 looking a bit weak, man. To be honest, I don't know is he up to it. And there was like mad westerly winds, so we kind of left it that right. We'll try over the next few days to launch him. I said, I'll I'll I'll. I'll feed him up and we'll check out in the conditions and what's going on. So, um, obviously, you know, at this stage, myself and Mary were bonding most fierce with the, with the pigeon, like, and, uh, like, like myself, he was a pure flirt with the women, and sp sp specifically my fiance, actually. Um, so Mary would feed him and she'd close the balcony door and he'd start picking at the door so she'd come out again. Um, if she left the room, he had a big problem with that. He'd start fluttering against the window until she came back. Um, we'd got some bird seed at this stage because he was after eating a sort of all our muesli. Uh, so he was actually literally eating out of our hands at this stage. Um, we had a nice little routine in the morning where he'd be sunbathing on a windowsill across the way and I'd come out to feed him and he'd fly over for the breakfast. Um, and like, even if we were going out in the car, he'd uh, come down and he'd follow you around the car park. It, it was like having a little pup, like, to be honest with you. So, what was, oh yeah. So anyway, I was unexpectedly called back to work in Dublin. So I rang Tom and I said, look, I'm coming up the road unexpectedly. This is probably our best chance to get the pigeon back to you. Like, can I bring him in the car? What's the story? And he was like, yeah. He, and he gave me some tips on how to catch him. And he said, put him into something like a shoebox and he should be fine. And um, that was grand. So I, we did like a wine box, so I put him into that. And off we went to Dublin anyway. Um, we stopped at that famous landmark, the Barack Obama Plaza. <laughs> USA. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I... I resisted my urge of my usual routine, was, which was getting a snack box from Supermax, because I didn't want to be eating another bird in front of JJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so uh, on to, on, onwards to Dublin anyway, and Tom had picked the maddest place to meet, like, uh, he, so he was like, we'll meet at the Hard Rock Cafe on Fleet Street. <laughs> uh, it's like, that, that really, that really tickled me, like a fellow who didn't know where the Hinch was, but he knew where the Hard Rock Cafe was. <laughs> so I was about 20 minutes away from there anyway, and I gave him a buzz. And I was like, Tom, I'm nearly there, man. And he was like, do you know what? I'm not coming in at all. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, this, this fellow is cheeky. Like, I was doing all the work in this relationship. <laughs> um, but he said, no, the reason I'm not coming in is you can just throw him up in the air when he's back in Dublin, and he'll find his way back. So. I was like, grand. He was like, take him up to a multi-story car park. So I went up. <laughs> <laughs> so I went up to uh, Jervis Street anyway, up to the top. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, up to the top anyway, and kind of took him out of his box. And he was kind of getting a bit emotional you know, at this stage. And we, we had a bit of a chat anyway, and I sent him off. And like, I don't have children but it kind of felt like you were dropping your only child to the airport as they were moving to Australia. That was... 
So I rang Tom, I said he's on the way, and I said, uh, give me a show when he gets in, please, because I just want to make sure he's safe. <laughs> so uh, I'd take a note of the time that he left, and Tom rang me back anyway. He was down the shops getting his messages, and by the time he got back, the uh, JJ was back, and uh, he was after timing it as well, so it took him six minutes to get from Jervis to his home place in East Wall after all that mad adventure he'd been on, which is seriously impressive, like. Um, so Tom was saying that I'm not a man for the prayers, but the next time I'm passing the church, I'll say a rosary for you. <laughs> and uh, he was saying that uh, if he, he was planning to breed JJ because he was one of his better pigeons, and he said if he had any kids, he'd name one of them after me. <laughs> Uh, so I like to think there's a bald pigeon flying around these wall called Karen. <laughs> Thanks, folks.